So our next presentation is Stony Brook University Open Access Policy, an annotated timeline. So we'll have a presentation of an annotated timeline detailing the development of the Stony Brook University Open Access Policy. Before its adoption in February 2017, the SBU Open Access Policy traveled a twisting path and withstood a number of challenges. This presentation describes the process of developing that policy, finding models, and a support community, working with the myriad stakeholders and collaborators, overcoming challenges, engaging the campus community, post policy promotion, education, and raising awareness of open access. We have two presenters that we're pleased to have with us today. Darren Chase is the head of scholarly communication at Stony Brook University Libraries, and his research interests include open access, scholarly publishing, user experience, and information literacy instruction. Shafiq Fazal is the Associate Dean for Library Technology, Discovery, and Digital Initiatives at Stony Brook University. He is a key member of the administration team and leads all technology programs and initiatives across the university libraries. His research interests include open access, open education, repository platforms, self-study and information literacy learning outcomes assessment, and floating libraries. Shafiq is a recipient of the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Librarianship. Thank you. Okay, we'll close that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to put up our um, uh, Google slides. Tell them about floating libraries. Well, let me tell you about floating libraries. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I came from Maritime College. I was in SUNY at Maritime College, so of course. There is a, a training ship, uh, and on the ship is a library. So we did a lot of work on that library. You know, I mean, there are challenges. There's no when you're out at sea. If you don't have a lot of money, you don't have any internet access. Those kinds of things. So we have to work around that to bring in digital resources, electronic resources on board the ship. Uh, communicating at ports with our librarian on the ship from port and. From a port in Europe back to us at Maritime, relaying information back and forth so they can, uh, you know, service the cadets on board the ship. So that's um, that's what we're working on. So, uh, anyway, while we're bringing that up, let me just start off by saying um, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, we. We, we started this open access campaign, scholarly communication campaign, back in 2015 at Stony Brook University. And when we started that off, you know, we said, this is what we're looking forward to here, to bring in, to join in with other SUNY colleagues, and to spread this message across all of SUNY. So it's not like we wanted to be confined and this to be only at Stony Brook University. If you're familiar with the UC model of how they went about with their open access policy, one of their um, uh, universities started it all, and then it spread across the, um, the California system. And so that's, that's our hope. And when we see events like this and at other institutions in SUNY and in CUNY or anywhere else, as a matter of fact, it's what, uh, you know, it's what we're, we're looking for. So this whole movement of open access is something we need to continue promoting, talking about, and get that message across. So thank you for inviting us. It's really a pleasure for, for both of us to be here. And we're both here because we were kind of involved, of course, together with that message across uh, Stony Brook, but also one of us, and more so uh, on my end, was more on the administrative level, and that's why I want to bring out in our presentation, and then Darren's work with the faculty and other departments and so on, and how we get that message across. So, um, with that said, we'll get started. So I'll, I'll start off with, with a few slides, and then Darren will step in, and he'll talk about um, uh, some of the other activities we, we have going on. So there we are. Um, you Darren. probably, yeah. Well, Darren. I'm Darren. And I'm Shafiq. But we want to say this. Take a look at those 
the pictures, right? That's mm -hmm. our, that's us okay, you before <laughs> we did the open access policy. <laughs> All right? <laughs> After the policy was passed, you're looking at us now. <laughs> See this? Yes. So that's how that. much work <laughs> went, yeah. went, went into yes. that. I've matured. <laughs> yes, I'm yes, we certainly now. have. All right. All right. So um, a little bit of outline of what we're going to do here today. We're going to talk about, of course, the very beginning of when this startup at, at Stony Brook University. What drove us to do this? What motivated us to do this? So we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about laying that groundwork to get this started at the university, get things going. Um, of course, key important, the advocacy, the outreach, and the education, the awareness we did across campus to spread this message, to get buy-in, very key, uh, and to, to, to you know, bring about that awareness. Then of the developing of the policy, open access at SBU, what's going on now, what happened back then, what's happening now. Um, observations, which is very key, we're going to tell you about some of the snakes and ladders, as we say, the ups and downs that we had with this. And of course, it was a process that went from 2015 to 2017 before the policy got adopted. So it's uh, about a year and a half or so, or maybe two years. Um, and then our next steps, some of the challenges we're seeing, some of the um, you know, observations of progress. So we'll talk about all of that. So let's start off with the, um, the driving factors. So back in 2015, um, our team was very involved with um, negotiations with Elsevier, an Elsevier contract. And I'm not really pointing out Elsevier alone here as, as, as of, you know, one of the, I don't want to say the bad guys into this, but there was an intense negotiation across Sony for Elsevier, and then our dean came back to the university talking to administration and, talk, and spoke with all of us librarians and said, the way these negotiations are going, something else has to be done. It's, it keeps escalating, increasing, cost factors keep going up every time there is a negotiation. So there's something's got to be done about this. Something in terms of, of, of joining the others in this whole open access scholarly communication um, movement. So we did that. And then, of course, the, the first bullet there is what I'm talking about, joining that movement, joining in with the open access um, you know, initiatives, what other um, universities, peer institutions have been doing. Uh, joining the movement, just to give you a little bit of detail there, back in 2015, you had about 50 plus uh, universities had already adopted open access policies. Um, you had about 350 universities with their own institutional repository, or the scholarly repository. Um, since then, Things have grown. You now have close to 70 uh, universities with their own open access policy, about 400 plus institutions with their um, repositories. So that movement is happening. And it's not, we're not, you know, it, it was, we felt at that time, 2015, it's time to get on board with this, try to join into that, and try to get open access as a, a mode of um, scholarly publishing at the university. Thirdly, it's a compliance with funding mandates. Now, all of you uh, probably are aware of, you know, the federal agencies and their mandates and uh, institutions now, if you're getting grants from those agencies, you have to comply. You have to be in compliance. Compliance at one point was um, uh, tied to the PIs of grants, but then uh, about a couple of years ago, they changed that to the institution being responsible for compliance with these grants. So as an, ins as an institution, you had to meet these compliance um, uh, requirements with the NIHs, the NEHs, NSFs, all of those. You, had about, you have about more than 20 or so, uh, 20 plus agencies that are requiring these compliance 
which is your publications resulting from the research has to be open access. Uh, and now there are data management plans that you have to meet and follow. So data management is also, and Darren will talk more about this, uh, some of the next steps or some of the steps we're looking at with our policy now on board, how we bring in data and, and, and a system with data management on campus. Um, scholarly publishing crisis, I'm not going to say more about that. We're all aware of that business model of you producing the content, giving it away, and then turn back around and buy it back. So what kind of a model is that, right? So that's our publishing crisis we have. One of the things we, we try to preach to the administration there for this whole uh, open access uh, movement is we can showcase and preserve the old uh, scholarly publishing from the university. So if we have a repository, we have this policy in place, we can capture all uh, Stony Brook University authors' uh, publications, showcase it. It's going to be a, a, like a, a you know one stop to showcase what your faculty are doing, but also at the same time we preserve it. Um, and SUNY resolution. Now you probably recall in 2015 SUNY actually passed a resolution that says um, as a university we should start supporting open access. It wasn't a policy, it was just a resolution. That resolution came to our university, to our university senate, and they unanimously supported that resolution. So at that time, back in 2015, it also gives us some encouragement that, hey, we need to now bring this further, not only pass a resolution and leave it there, let's move ahead with a policy now. So that resolution was back in 2015. SUNY recently revised or passed another resolution in 2017, which was after we adopted our policy. That 2017 resolution now includes Stony Brook University as a model to look at when you're developing and passing your um, policy. So we're very proud about that. Things are really starting to take shape. Yes. So now laying the groundwork. Of course, you can't do this without just talking about it on campus, right? You have to set the stage, lay the groundwork, get your staff behind this, get um, your facilities, get your tools in place, and put all that structure in place, or else it's going to fall apart. You're going to preach this to faculty, then they want uh, you know, certain tools, certain uh, platforms in place, and you don't have it, then it's going to fall apart. So we started off, and there you see our timeline during that time. We started off by repurposing, redesignating our top librarian, uh, Darren Chase, to be our scholarly communication librarian. Because Darren was always out there, always in the, interacting with the faculty. He was one of our top librarians, and we said, you know what, Darren is going to lead us in this effort. So Darren was, was then uh, redesignated as our scholarly communication librarian. So we set the stage there. We started to develop a center. We needed a presence on campus. So faculty can look and say, okay, I'm going to the center for scholarly communication in the library. So we designated a space, uh, set it up, training area, equipment. Um, have the head of scholarly communication in charge of that space, program workshops, program activities in that space. So though you can use any space, once you have that presence and you establish the center, it brings more meaning and sends the message across campus. So we, we developed the center and that was launched in, um, later in 2015, right Aaron? Yes. Late yeah. in 2015, uh, we developed the center, we put together a mini site, a mini website for the center that included links to resources, information, contact information, programming of events, um, maybe behind the scenes, not so much on the site, but just our strategy for performing outreach, uh, reaching out to faculty, taking advantage of opportunities to connect with faculty at different campus events. Um, badgering faculty in as kind and 
friendly, gentle way to get invited to faculty meetings, uh, reaching out and making connections through university faculty senate and faculty senate committees. Um, I, I could say more, but I don't want to yeah. take over right. your session. Well, uh, well, you will probably be included in that too on uh, later slides. Yeah. But uh, moving down, Darren mentioned the website. Of course, Academic Commons is our B Press platform. Um, so we had to establish that repository. Um, so we went ahead, uh, me, uh, speaking to administration and trying to get the funding to get a subscription to Academic Commons was not only coming out of the library. So we pulled in other departments into this. For example, the, uh, the Office of Research, because they had a stake into this. They want to meet compliance. They want to have a space for uh, their data management. So we got them involved in this. We also got the, the, the School of Medicine involved with this because a lot of them are um, having to meet that NIH uh, compliance too and a lot of them were interested in open access. So we got key stakeholders pulled into this as a more uh, group effort going to the provost, going to the president and say we got to get our uh, repository established. So that was one strategy of doing that so we established the commons. Um, raising awareness, we'll talk a little bit more about our strategy of this, but that was high on the agenda. You gotta go out there, you gotta raise awareness, you gotta get that message across. Um, so one way of doing that, we put together a group of librarians who were um, in, in the um, scholarly communication working group. So we designated a group of librarians to sort of put together a program and um, a plan and uh, outreach type activities uh, to get the message out there. Then our liaisons, all our librarians, all our librarians are liaisons to one or more departments on campus. So we, we, we put together a model for the liaisons. So all liaisons are now informed and kept updated of scholarly communication issues, open access issues, the message we're sending, and then the liaisons are then asked to take that to the departments that they are liaison to. So our liaison model worked very well. It's still in place right now. So that's how we keep the ongoing message going and outreach to faculty and all the other departments. So the liaison model was key in getting this done because not one person can do this. Not only the head of scholarly communication can do this, but it takes the entire village. So just quickly, that's our center for scholarly communication. Just thought I'd plug in a, a photo there of some, we have uh, discussions, round table discussion going on. So it's lots of different activities in the center. Um, but that's, that's the center. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, advocacy, outreach, and education. Yeah, so uh, our campaign of advocacy and outreach and education, if we bracket it in the, in the time frame leading up to the adoption of the policy, let's say you know, June 2015 through April 2016 of that year, I mean, some advocacy and outreach had happened well before that. But, had, but I, would, uh, I would qualify this as being the range just because this became part of a dedicated program of advocacy and outreach focusing on the adoption of an open access policy. I mean, like Shafiq said, identifying the, the fact that we wanted to support the adoption of an open access policy at Stony Brook was a big you know, first step in that direction, and a lot of things coalesced around that. So um, the major aspects of the advocacy initiative would, were um, making connections with the university administration. There were allies in the university administration, strong supporters of open access. Uh, the provost, the president, the president being a more remote 
I don't think I, I never met with a friend of the Did you? Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me let me just touch on this one, Darren. Touch on we it. we yeah, yeah. <laughs> we started from the top, right? So uh, our dean was was very active in getting this message across for the administrators. You had the the university council, which was um, the president's group. So at those uh, meetings, uh, we did presentations, made them aware of what open access is and talk more about it there. You had a provost advisory group, which is all the deans and chairs uh, across campus. You go there, you make presentations. The dean, of course, a member of all these groups, is always bringing that message across at the meetings. So your dean is very key. Your dean is here. <laughs> Yes. She's very key in, in sending this, taking this message to the administrators. Um, and, and then we went down to different uh, committees and groups, which is on the faculty level. Yes, so, that's me. Um, and one of the administrators was particularly key in making the open access policy happen because he's the one, the vice president for research at Stony Brook, who initiated the exploration for developing the open access policy through one of the Stony Brook University Senate committee groups, the research committee. He went to the research committee and said, it's a compliance issue. I've been talking to colleagues at other R1 universities. They have open access policies. This is the value that those policies bring. He sort of laid it all out to the research committee and said, go talk to the library. Because at all these other universities, my colleagues have told me the libraries play a central role. So I'm asking you, and you know, this effectively is a university senate committee that supports his work and the work of you know, and broadly research across campus. He's instructing them to reach out to the library. So another connection was made from university and faculty senate, and that connection was, uh, you know powerful, essential in getting the policy adopted. And it took a lot of work because in the way that the administrators, I think, were could easily embrace the idea of open access because for an administrator, there's not a, a lot at risk. And I think it was easier then for them to see the rewards or benefits of open access. For faculty and for researchers, it was more challenging, more complicated. This was our experience, probably your experience too. It's more challenging for some researchers and for some faculty and scholars to wholeheartedly embrace open access because they have, maybe they have mis understandings about what open access is. They think open access means just predatory open access publishers. So they've heard from friends and colleagues at other institutions that have open access policies that there are problems with it. Or they have heard, we, oh my god, the, the things that we've heard from faculty is outrageous things. Like there was this one faculty member I was speaking to who said, we're all going to be sued if there's an open access policy and we begin sharing preprints and postprints of our articles on an open access repository, the publishers will sue us. He was convinced and he insisted that we take a draft of the open access policy to campus legal and have them review it and approve it. And he wanted to send a copy of it to Albany and he did. I think he actually did. I'm pretty sure he did. He did. And our legal office had to be involved, and they just passed it. So they said they don't see any issue with this. So as Darren is saying, a lot of sometimes misconceptions with the faculty of really what open access is and what is being asked of them. So, so that's where of, the education for. Yeah, right? exactly. Because of the, the sensitivities of these ne negotiations, these discussions with faculty, um, there, there, we recognized there was so much work that needed to be done in fostering this relationship and building a relationship of trust. I feel like the trust was key. I think you'd agree with me, Shafiq. It, it was so key to just get to a point where, for the most um, passionately resistant members of the faculty, the most outspokenly resistant members of the faculty, required, I think, you know, extra attention and uh, to really determine action on our part to reach out to them as much as possible with um, 
you know, with information, with patients, listening to their concerns, addressing their concerns, and doing everything we could to demonstrate that we were, you know, acting in good faith, taking their concerns seriously, but also asking them to meet us where we were in describing the value of open access and, and the benefits to Slender. Also, our outreach activities were, were really hastened by and, and I think focused by the Open Access Symposium. So we had our first Open Access Symposium in 2015, all happening right around this time in 2015. Of course, this week and, and during Open Access Week, we had the symposium. And it was a, you know, a big campus event bringing a lot of tension, attention, attention to, attention to, <laughs> attention to, to open access. We uh, reached out to faculty across the disciplines at Stony Brook, the, the way we, and we continue to do this with our symposium. We have panels that are roughly discipline specific, and we invite panelists from among our faculty to be panel members as well as external folks from other you know, universities and, and research labs and institutions and pub public publications, people in the publishing business, you know, across the whole open access, throughout the open access environment, but our faculty, especially, to be included, to have their voices heard, to invite their participation, to, to uh, make sure that they understand that they're a big part of this, that this isn't something that just the library is doing. So every step of the way, very conscientiously, Shaheen, myself, uh, Constantia, always made the point that this is not just a library thing. This is not just a library initiative. This is for all Stony Brook, and this is for researchers, and this is for scholars, and this is for our students. And I think that really helped because those few faculty members that participated that first year, well, their colleagues were in the audience. So maybe they are skeptical about open access, but you know, they were able to take in and receive this whole day's worth of information about open access, participate in discussion, challenge speakers with tough questions, questions that maybe Shafiq and I have heard, but it was great for them to hear similar answers from, from other people other than just me, other than just Shafiq. So uh, that really helped in terms of developing this program. And then our workshops and our activities in terms of meeting with university senate committees. Uh, of course, the Senate Research Committee, we met with them all the time. We work very closely with them, but other Senate committees who might just invite us uh, because this was something that was moving through university senate. It came up in university senate meetings. People would be talking about it, sometimes arguing about it, and they'd say, well, let's invite those damn librarians to answer some questions. So they would invite us, and then we'd show up and smile and, and talk to them and take away their publications. Yeah, <laughs> take away their publications. Uh, but, but Darren is right. At one point, we start calling ourselves the roadshow. Uh, we were going to so many departments, so many Senate committees, and other committees and meetings, and give this presentation. So. As you were putting one of a, a policy out on your campus, just be ready. These are the kind of things, the outreach that you really got to do and get involved with. And be ready or willing to do that. Uh, and go there and try to convince. You're going to have to do a lot of convincing with the faculty <coughs> uh, what this is all about and how beneficial it is. Yes. So and these are just some, some pictures from Open Access Symposium last year. One of our keynote speakers, uh, Justin Peters, the author of um, Aaron Schwartz's biography and a, and a journalist. And then one of uh, our colleagues and then a couple faculty members. This was the Open Humanities Digital Humanities panel and this is our colleague Kate, who was the moderator of the panel and then faculty members from history and English who were, were panel members. So we have our third symposium tomorrow. So you can see Darren and I shooting out of here right after this trying to get back to be ready for tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. But we have, we have uh, someone from Spark speaking tomorrow, and we have someone from EFF. EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation. So it's going to be an exciting event. Um, this has been an exciting event. It's been great. So developing the open access policy. So um, what I just said about working with the Senate Research Committee, that was the 
the key piece of developing the open access policy. Because it came from the Vice President for Research, he initiated it in the University Senate, he told them to reach out to the libraries. We were on the ready, because we, like Shafiq said, Constantia had come back from negotiations with Elsevier, we already were developing this keen sense of the crisis in scholarly publishing and an appreciation of the value of open access. We had all of that. We were already providing that information and talking to people about it, anyone who would listen. But this is what catalyzed it in terms of making it something that the university wanted and was getting behind, or at least discussing and arguing about at this point. Right, so that's a strategy for not making it a library policy, or something coming out of the library, then the faculty are even more hesitant. Uh, so get the others involved, other areas, other departments, and it's now a university policy. And uh, we mentioned our president, but our president was on board with this policy. He supported it from the very beginning, so it even came down from him at those um, administrative level meetings that he wants to support this and he wants to move forward with this. So we got his support. Yeah, I would describe the administrators as, as key stakeholders, but they're not the only key stakeholders. I mean, it's just like fac departmental faculty are key stakeholders, maybe even more important stakeholders in the sense that if they didn't support it, it wouldn't happen. If it was just something the administration was saying to departments, do this thing because we think it's good, I would expect it wouldn't have happened. Uh, it was important to form partnerships, mainly through University Senate, but then that led us to the departments because we'd be working with and speaking with colleagues on the Senate committees, and then they would invite us to departmental meetings and say, why don't you come speak to the faculty in biochemistry and cell biology? Or why don't you come speak to the faculty in School of Dental Medicine and School of Business. Right, and these many others. Across, these are just two examples. We did this for departments and schools and colleges across campus, and this was a part of our strategy. We understood that STEM and particularly biomedicine would be a big part of this, and it was important to get the message to them um, because we felt it could become a snowball effect with biomedicine because they already had a tradition of participating in open access publishing through Biomed Central because the NIH was the first big governmental organization that had uh, a public access mandate. So they already understood, you know, to a degree, to a large degree, they understood the value of open access and open access is just a part of their normal everyday work for many researchers in, in biomedicine. And for some STEM fields, like physics, also a long tradition of publishing in open access through, or some kind of open access publishing through open access in the case of physics and, and astronomy and mathematics through archive. So making connections with faculty who may be committee members or committee chairs in the university and senate, presenting it to their departments, speaking to their faculty, getting their support so that they could present with us or participate in different events like the symposium, participate in panels on the symposium, and become our you know, strong voices, strong positive voices advocating for and working for the policy. So these partnerships were essential, they were vital, and it could have happened without their, um, their support. What we had uh, in the ready, uh, what I was saying a moment ago, was we had been aware of open access, but we had also been looking at open access policy models and the way open access policies were working at other universities, particularly other R1 universities. And we were asking ourselves the question, like, what is, what is uh, Stony Brook like, and what is SUNY like? And are there models of other universities, university systems, like SUNY, like Stony Brook, where there are successful open access policies? What do those look like? What do the policies look like? We spent time reaching out to, emailing, and talking to librarians at uh, you know, Cal State, the University of California systems, MIT libraries, Harvard, Harvard. And, and other, like Purdue, uh, Indiana State, other libraries where we saw their open access policies, saw their whole model of the way open access was supported 
through the libraries and through partnerships between the libraries and other units and divisions and departments on their campuses, asked them questions about it and had developed a couple model policies that we shared, we had ready and we shared with the, uh, the Center Research Committee and that really furthered the work because they had one meeting with the Vice President for Research who said talk to the libraries and I think what they expected is that they would reach out to us and it might be a whole year's worth of let's see, let's figure out how to do this and instead they reached out to us and immediately I emailed them you know, a, a, a zip file full of you know, three different model policies and, and copied Shafiq and said, we're ready to work with you. You know, here's what an open access policy looks like. We would love to come to your next meeting and talk to you about open access policies. Um, do you want to say something? Um, no. No. Well, I want to say, I, I always have the look. You do. You know, <laughs> um, uh, being ready, and that's what uh, Darren was trying to say there. Just be ready. Once it, because when they are ready to hear from you and what you think about uh, OA, and if you are ready with a sample model to show them, just be ready for that. Don't just take it and let time lapse and show that you are not ready. Then they get more hesitant and don't want to go ahead with the policy. So we were always ready. We were always reaching out, finding out what others were doing, and try to be ready with a model policy. And I think Darren will talk about the review and revision yeah. process. So if they turn it down and they say this policy will not work for us, for us, be ready to revise and go again. And we you know what? That is exactly what happened. They did turn it down. They didn't like those policies. So that was this is the way we work. You know, I will queue it up or Shafiq will and right over to me and then back to him. And so anyway, yes, they did not like the policies that we showed them. Or there was some interest in them initially, but then it got back to the Vice President for Research and he just said, no, this is not what I'm looking for because it doesn't say enough about compliance and it doesn't specifically say that the Vice President for uh, Stony Brook Medicine is a part of this. So he had his own motivations and things and expectations about how he wanted it to look from an administrator's perspective and who his partners were. And he wanted to make sure that they were on board with him and the faculty represented in the policy. And I mean, I'm thinking, yes, that that partnership was strong, but you know, again, it's what he wanted to see in the policy. So we had to make revisions to make sure that it included as the three main administrative units for the policy, the libraries, vice president for research and office of research, and the vice president for student medicine, so we medicine being the three main administrative units. But also, just in general, he didn't like those initial models and said, I'm thinking we use as a model then the University of California systems eventually. So, yeah, so uh, we started then looking more of system uh, yeah. policies rather than uh, those uh, institutions like Harvard and MIT and so on. So the Harvard one was, uh, is one they didn't like. Uh, UC system policy is what they sort of like, but we still had to tweak that one too. Uh, there were other systems, I think Southern, um, uh, Southern Illinois, uh, there are a couple of other systems of uh, policies that we took to them. Yeah. Um, University of Florida. University of Florida. Uh, but then, yeah, they were more trying to relate what SUNY is like to what other system out there is like. And then once we brought up the UC one, some of our naysayer faculty was contacting UC and trying to find all the negative issues of what they <laughs> had in their policy. It's true. So, oh my god, it's true. And yeah. also, this review and revision, revision process was really uh, lengthy and really involved. Line by line, word by word in some cases, we would sit and discuss in this University Center Research Committee and discuss and discuss and sometimes argue about the language of the policy and what it meant and how it could be changed or how it needed to be changed, had to be changed, um, and, and what, then what wasn't in the policy and why it wasn't in the policy. This took a long time and it was really 
really involved. And if there were any moments during the um, during the whole process where I, I was worried that it wouldn't happen, it was during this this process because they became such uh, such conviction behind the arguments for or against parts of the policy that that we were for some meetings at a complete impasse. I mean, we would end, we'd come back together the next meeting and try to untangle wherever we had ended up at the previous meeting. So these were really challenging, challenging meetings. The, um, the FAQ, uh, it's included on this because it comes out of this review and revision process and also a sort of re-upping of, of the advocacy, outreach, and education work that Shafiq and I were doing because we were beginning to tailor our outreach and advocacy efforts based on the resistance to the policy and the specific challenges and criticisms we were hearing in these meetings against the policy or certain aspects of it. For example, at one point, the whole Senate Research Committee decided that they wanted it to be an opt-in policy, not an opt-out policy. And so they thought this was the solution to a few of the, the, the really vocal challenges to the policy and to open access in general. They thought, well, let's just make it uh, opt-in. And then that solves all these problems. And so they felt really uh, accomplished. And I felt like we became such um, angels of darkness in the, in the meeting when, when they told us. We sat down and they were like, how about this? It's going to now be an opt-in policy, not an opt-out policy. And you and I looked at so, each other and then looked at them yeah. and said, no. Is opt-in a policy? An opt-in is not a policy. <laughs> opt-in is me saying, I want to do this. You don't have a policy telling me to do this, right? So they wanted an opt-in policy. It is not a policy. So we had that argument back and forth. A policy has got to be an opt-out policy. That's something to look forward to. I mean, if you look at all the policies out there, uh, they're all opt-out policies. Or else, you don't have a policy at the top. So, but they wanted the easy way out. You know, all faculty is going to be on board with this. Let it be opt-in. That's, that's not a policy. Yeah. And so it was those arguments and questions that really informed this out second wave of outreach. We created an FAQ. We would call, we would have conversations, and we would question by question, challenge by challenge, address these things. And our the, the current FAQ of the Open Access Policy retains all of these questions because we thought, okay, these are the hot button issues and these are the things, the flashpoints in that we're hearing on our campus about open access. And we wanted to address them. We wanted to describe why it isn't an opt um, in policy. We wanted to uh, we wanted to address why faculty won't be sued by publishers. We needed to address all of these and we did. So that's how we were tailoring our second wave of advocacy and outreach efforts. And then our first presentation to the University Senate was actually a bit of a disaster. She and I weren't even uh, there. Uh, and Constantino wasn't there, our dean. Libraries wasn't there because basically University Senate had been hearing about how challenging the negotiations in the, um, the research committee's meeting were, so they sort of demanded the research committee bring the policy and draft and report on it. And they told us, Shafiq and I, I said, well, you come to and explain this policy. And we said, well, it's not, remember, it's not a library policy. This is the University Senate policy we're working with them and it's not ready. So we would rather not report the University Senate right now in the environment of the, the campus at that time and where we were in the discussions about open access. So it's a very challenging time and we knew it really wouldn't have been productive to go and present to the University Senate, but they insisted. So a incredibly brave member of Senate Research Committee, I think they drew straws, she drew the short straw and so Iris went and she presented to the University Senate, presented on open access and the policy and development. And, um, you know, it came back, to, so they were just like, well, get this together. They sent it back to research um, committee and they said, not only is it something the research committee has to look at, now we want two other Senate committees to review and approve the policy. So it was sent to the Library Services Committee and there was, 
haven't really went through that other committee, but they said they wanted us to yeah, go through skip, skip. Senate skip. Committee of Information Technology. So what Darren was just saying, we recognized at that time with the Senate, this was at the height of all the uh, controversy of this. And uh, that was not going to be a productive Senate um, presentation or meeting. And, and things weren't ready. You had the committees against each other about this. And uh, they were talking about language and, and revisions of the policy. So it, there was, in some way, we felt that was a strategy to just bring this policy and turn it down right then and there at that Senate meeting. So we all pulled out. All of the librarians, we, we decided we're not going to present this. It's not ready to present to the Senate because all these revisions have to take place. And so we took a stand and we did not go and present it at that time. And another thing that we felt was important was that we wanted the Senate Research Committee to unanimously approve a policy before it went back to University Senate, and we weren't at that point yet. And that's what we told president, the president of the Senate that we didn't want to be there because it was still in production, and we felt like the committee would eventually unanimously approve it. We were looking for that moment uh, and for that, you know, finality of the completion of the policy before we presented. But then it got more complicated because we were told they would have to go through the other committees. You would think that the Library Services Committee would be such a welcoming, uh, yes, a welcoming committee to the idea of an open access policy. And perversely, they sort of principally weren't supportive of open access, but were incredibly suspicious of our initiative and what we were doing with an open access policy at Stony Brook. So that was a really challenging negotiation. With, you know, within a couple of weeks, the Senate Research Committee had approved, uh, unanimously approved the policy, and it went to the Library Services Committee. They did not approve it. And so by December 2016, just before the break, they said it just sort of all fell apart, the Library Services Committee. As strange as that uh, sounds to a room full of librarians, it just fell apart in the Library Services Committee. And we came back in January after the break. I went to the Library Services Committee uh, again. I answered their questions. I said, look, the Senate Research Committee has approved this policy. Let's hear your objections. Let's have a vote on this. Let's just like make this happen. Like, say you like it, say you don't like it, but we need to bring this to University Senate. And you know, you've asked all your questions. I've answered your question. That your review of this is complete. So after that meeting, they um, almost unanimously approved it. There was one holdout who did not support it, but otherwise the committee supported it. And then the next University Senate meeting on February 6, 2017, then we, you know, we presented the policy, and yes, we had a good policy so was adopted at Stony Brook. And so I just want to say something before Darren continues. Um, during all this controversy, uh, a couple of editors of journals were the key um, resistance. So you get a picture of this, right? And these were editors of Elsevier journals. Um, you know, among our faculty. Among our right. faculty. Right. So that's, you got to be ready for that. Because you're going to have your long-time editors, traditional um, authors publishing in these resources. They're not going to buy it easily. You get more of the, the, the newcomers, the, the newer faculty who are publishing and more aware of these issues are coming on board faster than the others. So after that, we, we felt so thrilled and excited that the policy had been adopted, and then we went to work because we felt we needed to create an insight for the policy, make sure that faculty understood what the policy meant, how to comply with the policy, how to deposit articles into our academic commons, our, our um, digital commons instance that's our open access repository. We had um, a series of open access open houses we, on both sides of campus, we invited faculty to attend, to ask their questions. We gave a demonstration. We gave demonstrations at, um, at departments, again, taking, making the rounds to different departments and 
then we would schedule consultation and do presentations that were to small faculty groups or even individuals who were interested. So you would think the policy got adopted and okay, work is done. Right? It's all over now. That's when it starts. Right? You now got to get your faculty to understand the policy and to abide by the policy, which is still work in progress. We're still working on that. But the policy was adopted um, unanimously, by the way. No one um, gave a negative vote on it. So at the end, it all worked out. Everyone understood what this is all about and it got adopted events. So here's just a couple pictures from two of our open access and open house events. And uh, yeah, so some observations of what you've heard during the course of this presentation, but just an important takeaway is that you definitely will receive resistance if you are seeking to develop an open access policy because there are entrenched you know, opinions against open access, or misunderstandings in most cases, um, because of predatory publishers, because they associate open access with that, because they don't quite know what open access is or what it means, but they have assumptions, uh, or heard from colleagues at other universities um, what it is or what it means. So uh, as a quick example of that, they all felt, not all of them, but most of the faculty felt, okay, open access means I now have to publish an open access journal only, and I have to uh, give up publishing in those high impact journals and those, um, you know, those um, subscribed journals. But that's not what our policy is about or what we were uh, sending the message about. It is about your work, your preprint, your postprint abiding by publisher sharing agreements, which, as you know, sites like Sharpa, Romeo, and all of those can give you details of all those sharing agreements, and abide by that, and for the good of everyone that the work you're producing, share your preprint, your postprint up on the repository, follow the embargo rules, we'll then make the actual published version available in the repository, and just share your work that way. So that took a lot of educating, of getting them to understand, getting them to be aware of this. Because all they thought about is, okay, we now have to publish in lower impact journals. We have to um, worry about getting tenure because we don't have the right kind of publications. Um, and, and issues like that. So we really had to get that message across. And some of them, in their own little world, didn't really want to buy into that still, but it, it took it took a while to get that message across to show them. And by the way, we were putting up um, our repository, Academic Commons, whether the policy got passed or not. So we got our Commons up and running before the policy got adopted. And in some ways, that showed them too what a repository is all about and what we can do with a repository. And that probably helped in their mind. Yes, that's true. Um, and then, you know, what Shafiq has just said uh, goes back to taking the time to listen. You know, I, it's, it's our experience in life, not just at work, but in life, that um, people who are distressed or upset um, want to, in most cases, know that they're being heard. And it, it was, no different. In fact, it was, I think, a really important part of the work that we did with the open access policy was understanding that the people who were maybe sitting across the table yelling at us really wanted to be heard. And as hard as that moment was, uh, we would just listen. We would listen, we could reframe the question or the comment or the statement, and we could, you know, address it calmly, as calmly as we could. And they were yelling at us across the table. Yeah, it's uh, true. They got people heated yelling. conversations yeah. across the table. Um, and so, yeah, and along with being a good listener, also important, I think a big takeaway was don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, before this whole process began, I was a pretty retiring guy, you know? I was a lot younger, felt younger, felt quieter. <laughs> I was just a librarian doing my library thing. Um, now, now I'm sort of uh, stridently unspoken. An anarchist. <laughs> test and uh, anyway, I'm not afraid to speak up. And I think uh, I learned a lot about uh, advocating for um, 
with the truth of this initiative, uh, in, you know, and in, in general, just speaking up. But definitely the truth of open access and the truth of the policy that we were presenting to them, it was important for us also to be fair and to make sure we were, you know, that they were listening to us, those uh, opponents of the policy of open access. So we can to speak up. And be consistent with your message and you send it. Um, but yeah, uh, let them speak, but then rebut. Make them aware of what it is. So at every turn, um, a big takeaway of our presentation, I think you recognize, is that at every turn, at every step, outreach and education, outreach and education is happening. And we recognize that we still are deeply invested in doing outreach and education, but we have to maintain these relationships, build them, we have to, and, and partnerships with faculty, and there's still more faculty to reach, students to reach, we have to get the word about the policy out there. The policy is there, and yet I, I think my impression, and I think you would agree, most faculty on campus don't know about the policy and don't understand how the policy works if they do know about it. So um, we're continuing to listen to them and incorporate good ideas, good suggestions about how to improve the policy, how to improve the experience of depositing in the repository, other aspects of sharing preprints or postprints, not in academic comments, but in other discipline specific repositories like National Archive or PubMed Central, and how that works with the policy. Uh, making it easier for them, basically making it as easy as possible for faculty and for students to um, be in compliance with the policy, participate in open access. So look at tools that you can implement to make things easier. For example, uh, faculty are publishing in PubMed Center. Right? Open access is a requirement, it's a compliance. With PubMed Central, which is something we're working on now, you can harvest what they publish in PubMed Central and pull it into your repository or do cross-linking. Uh, you don't have to pull the entire content. And then you explain to faculty, this is more exposure. You know. Many repositories have it. Um, it's not, if they, if they submit an archive, the physics and math repository, then let's have a cross-link in our repository. More exposure for you, but also showcasing what the Stony Brook University faculty is publishing. Um, you know, tools like that. Um, what's the other one? Oh, uh, uh, MIT was successful in working with Springer to have Springer upload automatically all preprints of MIT's authors. They did that. So that's something we're reaching out to publishers and say, well, hey, all Stony Brook University authors, once they submit publications to you, of course, you take preprints, you, you do the editing on those, you get those ready. They all have the preprints of, of, of those publications. Let's upload those automatically to the repository. Um, so those are different tools you can work with the publishers. Uh, you know, different other open access repositories to try to develop your repository and also to show faculty at the end, okay, this is what, uh, this is the work you're doing, this is what's uh, being um, populated in the repository without them having to do it themselves. And that's also key as we see now as we're moving forward. Of course, they agree with the policy, they like the policy, but they don't want to go create an account on B-Press and submit their preprint. So now we have to work with tools on getting that done for them. We're also looking to have, identify faculty who can be champions of open access and help their colleagues understand it and understand how it works. Sometimes my experience is when talking to a faculty person, I think they're hearing me, but they're also hearing the librarian. They're hearing the librarian's perspective. When they're speaking to a colleague in their department, or maybe even another department whose faculty person shares the concerns, preoccupations that the faculty person has, they might be hearing something maybe not very different, but therein lies something really powerful. And it's really you know, triggering some kind of aha moment for them. So part of that, we, we're looking for creative ways to identify those champions and really kind of leverage their enthusiasm for open access and their participation in the policy 
with reaching more faculty and uh, students and also continuing to further develop our whole approach to open access uh, at Stony Brook. And part of that um, for, for open access week this year are these faculty testimonials we put together at the top of the day. So we've got some librarians and faculty and, and some students here who, um, and we printed these out, so they're just enormous posters and they'll be displayed at the symposium tomorrow. They're, they're on display in our central reading room uh, right now and they're also online and, and on our, uh, our, our scholar uh, systems and then the library. But this, uh, this is at Feldman, he, some of you may know because I think he was University SUNY Faculty Senate President. But he's also a president of our university senate at Stony Brook. The, you know, he's a supporter of open access, but I look at this and his excellent message and his smiley face, and I, I'm reminded of a phone call that I had with him right about a year and a half ago. He was like, Darren, open access just isn't happening at Stony Brook. So, <laughs> right. so we he, weathered that, we got through that. So and, uh, let's see. Um, oh, here's Brave Harris. She's the one who drew the short straw on the Senate Research Committee and had to go to the University Faculty Senate to present on the incomplete open access policy over those terrible conditions. But she, you know, stands strong and is, uh, you know, ardent supporter of open access and, uh, and you know, and others. But I just wanted to point them out and just this whole, you know, thing. These are faculty from across campus, different disciplines, different departments, all you know, speaking it out about open access, the value of open access. So, oh, and yeah, we're looking to migrate out the press since Elsevier bought the press. We're feeling like, it's a couple of factors. Elsevier buying the press is alarming to us, um, and VPress is very expensive. And we have now on staff a librarian who had experience at her previous institution of developing Fedora, right, Fedora, uh, and, and developing excellent uh, meta repository, which is the kind of solution we've been seeking for years now because of the state of our myriad repositories in Stony Brook, I think we have five. Yeah, we have um, pockets of university archives, special collections, um, uh, B Press, uh, Academic Commons, uh, Shared Shelf at one point, we canceled them, Content DM, all these pockets. So we're going to pull everything together. But with that, doing that, we're going to go with the Fedora, uh, Samvera stack. Uh, with that, we're going to come off of B Press. Uh, and more so also because we were sort of alarmed with Elsevier taking over B Press, purchasing B Press. Not that we're, we're sure what's going to happen, we're all unsure. We're all certain <coughs> where the product is going, what's going to happen there. So, and we're not alone in this, by the way. I think it was Penn State. Or yeah. Yeah. Penn State sent out an open letter to invite libraries to collaborate with them to develop a tool to migrate off of ePress because they're also concerned of where ePress is going. So um, that's something we're working on. And you know, continuing to look at ways that we can promote and work for open access throughout the SUNY. Throughout, throughout the SUNY, system. that's key. You know, yeah, that key. Um, partnering with, with Albany, partnering with other university centers, with colleges in different ways, not necessarily on open access policy. I would think there's only benefits to that, but just other open access initiatives, seeing ways that we can work together because of the experience at Stony Brook, and, and maybe part of the bigger story about SUNY in general is, is as we begin to work system-wide, we. We have this acute awareness of the silos that we work in, the different kinds of silos that exist on the campus level at Stony Brook. There are silos within silos. Um, finding ways out of those silos and, and ways to work meaningfully together um, is such a worthy challenge, right? So we're, we want to do that and find opportunities, meaningful opportunities to do that. So I think what we want to do is make room for questions in the next yeah. 10 minutes or so. Yes. Yes. Um, at the SUNY level, uh, there is an institutional repository, right? Which I don't think is heavily used, and 
the platform is the space, the space yeah. why not use that instead of Fedora? We're talking about silos and all that. Yeah, great question. We have DSpace also on our campus, and as we look at DSpace, we see limitations in terms of what we want to do. Mm -hmm. We want a, a one platform environment that's going to have these um, uh, categories or collections that tie into all these different areas, special collections, university archives, our ETDs, uh, theses and dissertations, our um, scholarly publications. So we see some limitations with these space as we're working with it right now. So we figure the Fedora stack is going to be better. And we looked at some models, uh, Michigan, and um, there were a couple of other universities with models with the Fedora stack Northwestern. and Northwestern, and it's working very well. Including uh, another key part of this is we want to move towards data and data management and capturing data, research data, and the Fedora stack works with that. And it works with more so um, larger sets of data. So some of these repositories like Bpress and DSpace and so on will have limitations of what size of data you can store. So Fedora works with larger sets of data. And you're going to host everything in your own service at the university? Own service, yes. You will have space in your... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what kind of support staff do you have in place to run Fedora? We have, it's not a lot by any means, but we have two programmers and, um, and actually another senior programmer. So we have three programmers. I mean, they're also dedicated to different areas with Aleph and Alva coming on board and all our other systems and WordPress and everything else. But three programmers will be involved with this. And we have a librarian who we recently hired. She came from Northwestern. And uh, she was working with the Fedora stack there. Mm -hmm. She has a lot of knowledge about it, um, not so much at the programming side of things, but also um, organization structure, um, uh, metadata um, uh, structure and all of that. So we're gonna tap into her knowledge for that. And so we feel like we're sort of ready now to do this. Mm -hmm. We've always wanted to do it. We've always wanted to also move away from these subscribe type platforms and move to more open access platforms, open source platforms. Um, so this Fedora is one of those. Are the programmers all in the, in the library? Or yes, are they are all in the library. Yes. So we have a library IT department, which I'm heading. We have three programmers. We have a web services librarian, a digital projects librarian. We have Darren as the head of scholarly communication, and we have a multimedia resources specialist. It's a really good question um, because there, it's always a, a tough decision when you look at what kind of resources, including human resources, we have and are available to make a success out of an initiative like this versus what uh, a hosted service like like the press uh, can deliver. Um, and so in this case, it, I think what Shafiq is describing is so accurate and but also very specific to what's happening at Stony Brook. I'm not sure if that's the way it is here at Albany or other universities, but the reality of all of these different legacy um, repositories on different platforms, that's unwieldy. And we have to come up with a, an effective solution to that and at the same time evolve. So it's like, Got to do something about the repositories and what's the future? What's, what do we want the future to look like? So we definitely want it to be a single system. And none of the things we currently have, including Vpress, can be that single system. We, we know it has to be something else. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, it's, as you said before, it's just hard persuade faculty to uh, create accounts in the repository. At the same time, it seems like no problem for them to create accounts in academia.edu. It doesn't seem like any effort for them, but in fact, in terms of minutes, and difficulty is kind of the same. And what do you think is that? And what would you do to solve that issue beyond education? Because we already educate them. So what solutions for that? Um, I'll talk about it. the technical part of that, the tool we're working on is sort of with the system we're going to have 
is get their account already created so we work with the university's CAS system so faculty don't have to go and create an account it will already be there it's like everything else on campus right uh, right now we don't have that with Bpress and we've had some challenges with Bpress trying to do that with our CAS system um, so with the system we're going to go we're going to try to eliminate that problem but there's another side to what you're asking too in terms of these other uh, platforms that faculty are more in tune to do it because they see other benefits maybe other than just having to create an account and upload the content like ResearchGate and, and academic uh, the edu by the way ResearchGate there was there's an issue going on right now you're probably aware of that um, um, in terms of the challenge to that of talking to faculty, I would still go back to the idea of the more exposure you have with your uh, work, the better it is. If you want to do academia at EDU, go ahead, put it out, uh, but allow us to put it in our repository too. We'll give you more exposure, more you know, the metrics go up for you, more citation, more impact of your work. Um, so just preach it to them that way. We're not going to tell them, don't go to uh, our college, don't go to PubMed Central, which they have to go to PubMed Central, by the way. But don't, uh, don't try to stop them from what they're doing, but this is in addition to that. And then maybe try to get the tools in place to do it for them. So they don't have to feel, okay, it's another step I have to do, and they're just not going to do it. So. so was the BPR concerned about having enough funds to resource people paying for open access publications, number one? And number two, uh, uh, did you write any federal grants to help you do that? Well, those are great questions. So the first question, the BPR, strangely, never expressed any concern about article processing charges, though faculty have questions about article process attorneys all the time. And the uh, I can't characterize like what his um, uh, perspective is on APCs or what he might believe the role of the Office of Research is in terms of APCs, though it is a good question. And I, I think with, with other libraries, at other universities, other institutions, it kind of gets then bounce back to the library to address this. Faculty are asking us because we're on the front lines and we're talking about the open access policy. Of course, our policy, the way it works, we're not telling them to publish in open access journals, but we understand that for some disciplines, some of the top journals, the core journals, are open access journals, like, pl like a PLOS journal or, or a Biomed Central journal. They're open access, they have APCs. Stony Brook doesn't have any dedicated fund or any coherent dedicated solution to APCs. It's up to individual faculty members and or departments to provide solutions for funding APCs. The second question, did we get a grant for, if I'm understanding you, is it did we get a grant to help us with the development of the open access policy? No, but it just, it, it costs us uh, time uh, but it didn't really cost us anything. It was a huge investment of time. Um, I, I suppose where the cost was, was in the repository, which we had already committed to and didn't see, like Shafiq said, it wasn't seen as being directly connected to the policy. We were going to use, we were going to establish this open access scholar repository, whether or not we had an open access policy in Stony Brook, because we wanted to demonstrate our commitment to open Access. That said, um, I'm thinking, you know, hindsight is, yeah, why didn't we do that? Because I think that would have been a smart thing to do. To and, and really, I can generalize and say that about almost every library initiative. We have some big ideas, and, and they're expensive ideas in some cases, and it's not been my habit to think, let's get grant funding for this. Um, it hasn't been, but it is now. I see more and more of the value we can uh, grants funded um, work that really greases the wheels and really supports initiatives. So it's a great question. And it's a great By point. the way, I just want to say uh, uh, with our policy and as we promote this across campus, we were not 
promoted APCs. We were actually taking a stand against APCs, especially in some cases, high APCs, like you pay $5,000 to publish one article, I think that's outrageous. Um, so we were not promoting APCs at all. And the campus, like Darren said, the university do not have a model or a system like some other universities, they do have this. Um, I think if you go on the uh, COPI site, C-O-A-P-I, they will give you a list of those institutions that provide support for APCs, uh, but we do not have that at Stony Brook University. Have you seen an impact on your uh, journal subscription uh, requirements for revenue as you move in this direction? Because this was sort of one of the drivers for establishing this policy. So, and, and as you were speaking, I was wondering if the revenue that you got to hire those programmers for Pinar or Beatrust or whatever it is was shifted from subscription costs to actually uh, doing that kind of work. It's too soon. It's too soon for that. It's the hope that with a policy in place that there can be negotiations later on with vendors, but there has been no impact at all on subscription costs or what we have actually right now we're really trying to meet our collections budget to, to subscribe to everything we want to subscribe to but it's still soon for that the policy was just passed a few months ago but one thing we're looking at now is as we talk to publishers and negotiate new contracts with them we're making them aware of the policy Actually, Darren has also reached out to publishers when the policy was passed. And if you look at publishers like Wiley, for example, they will have a list on their site of all those institutions who has policies. And when an author from that institution is submitting to Wiley for publication, they will follow their institution's policy. And I think that's something wonderful that Wiley is doing. But anyway, our aim is to use this policy to negotiate with publishers, not so much to reduce the price, but to negotiate with them that we now have a policy, our authors are retaining their rights, our authors can use their work however they want because they are retaining their rights. And also we as a university are now gonna be putting their work up on a repository to make it open to everyone. And it's more so to get that message across to them. And it's the hope, as this whole open access movement is about, that there's more and more repositories are out there and this keeps moving forward. Publishers will then not have a stronghold monopolizing market on you to negotiate and call whatever price they want to call and say, well, if you don't subscribe to us, you're not going to get this content anywhere else. It's the intention of now, content are going to be more open. So the whole idea of openness. Can I ask one yes, question? sure. So in, in your opening remarks where you talked about sort of the value and proposition of the drivers, um, I don't think I recall uh, from my perspective seeing that maybe one of the huge drivers from the president uh, was the reputational benefit of making all of your work, that's really important, right? Completely available to everybody in the world for free. And the benefit in citation, index uh, measurements, uh, and republishing and so forth. Um, have you seen that impact or is it too early and was that uh, partially a motivating factor of this whole idea now about communicating your science? I mean, you have the Ellen Alda Center where you're trying to make the faculty trained how to communicate science and it's a big deal, right? Right. Right. No, that's an excellent question. Good point. And that, that was a factor. It is too soon to tell, um, but it's an expectation. That it will have it will have it, the kind of influence that you just described. So that's a huge value proposition yeah. for faculty. Yeah. Is to say you're at an R1 university. Yeah. Right. This is only going to help you. Right. But I just want to say, um, I mean, in one of my earlier slides, 
we mentioned about showcasing uh, Stony Brook University faculty work. So that was a key, and the other, he brought it up. The president really bought, bought into that. He was very uh, excited about that because now he can go around and say, okay, go to this link and see all the, the work my faculty is doing. So he really bought into that. We also tie it into, we're part of the AAU. So we all, when we present it to him, we try to, because he's always big on AAU and what they're doing and our ranking on AAU. So we presented to him what other AAU institutions are doing and the repositories they have and how this is benefiting them. So that was a key factor, really. Thank you all. Thank you. So just a couple wrap up things. We have a raffle. Yep. Um, also, as you are getting ready to go after the raffle, uh, Arena Holden's class, UNL 299, Information Literacy and Math and Statistics. They used a lot of open um, access resources in their research, and some of their research will be available on our institutional repository. That's what's showing on the slideshow in the lobby if you'd like to take a peek. And we need somebody to pull the raffle ticket. Would you like to pull the raffle ticket? No, I think David should do it because he's our he's he did all the gizmo stuff. And without yeah. gizmos, nothing would work. So what am so I doing? Just so you know, the, the, the door prize consists of a number of lovely vendor promotional items, but also some U Albany library items and a fifteen dollar Starbucks. Pull somebody out of there. Bring you Starbucks. Uh, David Dickinson. <laughs> no. Uh, Susan D. Oh, that's me. No. Oh, yeah. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you all for coming on behalf of the dean and the university libraries and the university. Thanks especially to all of our fabulous speakers and to our OA Day committee for all their work in assembling such a successful program. Uh, in keeping with our open access theme, our videos, our slides, and other content from today will be hosted on our Scholars Archive, which is our institutional repository. Thank you again to the University Libraries for all their support, to the University Auxiliary Services, who provided all the fabulous food. And we are done. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.